Thank you for allowing me to come. I represent uh, Aerial Services, and that is a mapping company. They have airplanes with million dollar cameras in their pods, in the bellies. And the Google mapping that you see and that type of thing is, is what they basically uh, photograph. And the company operates this airplane and from time to time has to meet the requirements of the FARs and has an annual inspection. In this occasion, it took it to Des Moines Flying Service. They received a telephone call indicating that they needed to replace the pilot and co-pilot windshields. The pilot and co-pilot windshields were about 30 to 35 years old at the time. <clears throat> and there were no apparent defects or deficiencies, but the, with the sophisticated use of a prism, the inspection will reveal whether there's dif difficulty or damage down into the frame. It was determined that there was potential, and they called aerial services and said, <coughs> we think you should replace these, the pilot and co-pilot windshield. And they agreed to do that, and uh, as the briefs show, it's a very expensive project. Um, we paid that bill, and we left with the plane, and we operated that plane for 10 months at which point the pilot and co-pilot windshield broke at 24,000 feet while the plane was operating. The pilot declared an emergency, found that he could make it to Des Moines, took it to Des Moines Flying Service, where they once again replaced the 10-month-old pilot and co-pilot windshields. We didn't pay the bill. And uh, Steve, on behalf of the plaintiff, filed a lawsuit in contract on an account claiming that we owed them money for the, the product that was. Am I correct that the windshield, it looks like in the record, the windshield came with a manufacturer's warranty, but it was only for six months, is that right? <laughs> there was a manufacturer's warranty that Piper developed, and pursuant to a contract and agreement with Des Moines Flying Service, their representative, <clears throat> it was supposed to be transferred and communicated to the, to the buyer at the time of sale but they never did. That was not their pattern of practice, so the warranty limitation that Piper drew up never became part of the contract or the bargain. It was never communicated to the seller, and no, none of the, compli the compliance with the Uniform Commercial Code, which requires a specific waiver of the implied warranty of merchantability to meet certain specifications, to be in writing, to be bold, those types of things were never never performed, didn't become the basis of the bargain, and did not become an issue in the case. Would this be a different case if it had been communicated to your client? Uh, we wouldn't be here. It would have been, because you can, you, as you know, under the Uniform Commercial Code, you can waive the warranty of, the implied warranty of merchantability, but it is sort of the granddaddy of all the warranties because it's implied and inferred, and it, it, it happens and attaches automatically to all goods that are sold which, as you know, are defined basically just as movables, and uh, it can be waived. And so can the consequential, consequential damage provisions of the Uniform Commercial Code by version of those uh, additional s statutes as well. I, I, is the basis <coughs> of your claim is that the statute that allegedly protects Des Moines Flying Service doesn't apply if there's only property damage? Well, can I speak it in detail on that issue? Because it appears that is, that's the issue that's confused in the lower court. The action that's brought is an action on account. It's a contract action. The issue that seems to confound lawyers and lots of, that's been involved in, um, in the clarification by this court and other courts for 25 years is the confusion that arose out of the fact that the remedy implied warranty of merchantability is the same caption whether it's a contract or a tort. So you have to be able to define and the remedy that's available. And the remedy that's available is generally based upon the relief that's requested. And these, this court, as well as many other courts, have made it very clear that the economic loss doctrine is an exclusive remedy for contract. It attempts to put you back in the same position as you were before, which jurisprudentially is the contract remedy, where the, dif the distinction and the tort remedy is one where the product itself, the defect, causes the failure of the pro of property or personal injury of the other party. 
This was a contract action. I, I, I pled affirmatively the implied warranty of merchantability in response to a claim for damages. But where does the statute distinguish between a contract and a tort action? Well, the Uniform Commercial Code is exclusively contract, and your courts have consistently held that where the remedy under the implied warranty of merchantability is basically limited to the economic loss doctrine. In other words, the damage that's to the product itself. I bought a mixer, it's defective. That's a contract. If it's a merchant that's involved, I have a I understand that, but the statute seems to be broader than, you know, which just contract or just tort. Which sure. statute are you referring to, Judge Williams? I'm talking about 613.18. All right, but my claim is under, under the Uniform Commercial Code, implied warranty of merchantability and contract, which is not a tort theory, and it's only limited to the damage to the windshield itself. And all of the case law from this court, as well as previous courts, would show that that remedy is in contract. So then the issue will then become, can you take the, the contract remedy of implied warranty and merchantability that's found in the UCC and apply 613.18, when in fact 613.18 clearly is not a contract remedy, and if you look to its caption, it's captioned products of liability. And your case law has also interpreted it as a, as a follow-up. But the statute came out of an omnibus bill. It didn't come out of a, uh, a, if you look at the bill book and you look at the legislative history, it was a, it was a tort reform bill that had dram shop in it and everything else. And they chose to put this in the chapter six, um, 613 rather than chapter 668. And when they passed it, so, you know, I don't know why it isn't more expansive than just the personal injury part of it. Well, then you're looking at legislative intent and uh, the basic rules of construction, especially the ones in, in your recent case of Samuels, Samon versus Pella would be indicative. Um, for, for one thing, when you have to look at the statutes in Paradolecto, I'm I pled this case in contract under the Uniform Commercial Code, okay? So what happened is the court made specific findings that the damage was limited to the, proper, the product itself and did not go beyond that or cause property damage or damage to a third person. So by it, definition, Pardon? Absolutely not. Products liability is defined under the restatement third that was adopted by this court and every other case that you have to say a products liability case is only the tort remedy for the implied warranty of merchantability for injury and damage to the persons and property. The contact track remedy is under the, is under the economic loss doctrine. And but the this, this statute's written this way, not liable for damages based on strict liability and tort or breach of implied warranty merchantability for the product. Couldn't they say, if, if your argument's correct, strict li it's not based on strict liability or breach of implied warranty merchantability and tort? I mean, the tort only defines the strict liability. It doesn't go to the implied warranty part of the statute. And, and that's what your court's been struggling with for years, is we've been confounded by, e even in uh, a recent case where an attorney was fined $25,000, arguing that the economic loss attributable to her claim, which was to the product only, was a tort. And this court ruled that no l competent lawyer could ever argue that this was a tort when the, it was an economic loss doctrine. But, but what is it about the language of Section 613.18 that creates the continuation of this debate that we've been having for generations and generations over tort theory versus contract theory? Well, part it of it, I think... It doesn't seem like the legislature was tuned into that when they used the language. All right, but, but please remember that you, in your rules of construction, you have to assume that the legislature knew the law. You have to assume that the Constitution, the article that requires the caption to identify the statute is correct. And if you read the caption on this statute, you will see that it says products liability. Products liability can only be defined in tort. The third restatement com completely confirms right. that. And, and I... I mean, I agree we can use that, but only if we can use the title, but only if we find the language uh, to be ambiguous in the first place. I mean, why, it, I look next door in Illinois, and the way they word their legislation is, in any product liability action based on any theory or doctrine. Now, that language seems to me leave, it is what you're arguing for here, but that isn't what the legislature here used. They simply 
strict liability and tort or uh, implied warranty of merchantability? Well, first we have to look at your case law and determine whether or not, whether or not the implied warranty of merchantability in contract is what the legislature intended to limit in terms of a seller. But to do that, Judge, you have to go back to your rules of construction. You, but if you look at the, you know, you talk about the title in our Iowa Constitution. It's not the title on the, the title that the code editor gives as appears in the code. It's the title that appears in the bill as introduced. And the title that appeared on the bill that introduced said, limiting the liability of non-manufactured for claims based on strict liability and tort or breach of implied warranty providing sanctions for filing or commencing frivolous actions. So again, the tort only defined the strict liability and it did not limit it to the breach of implied warranty. And that's the title we look at for legislative intent, not the title the code editor gave in the bill. Well, I think that what you look at is the rule of construction that you adopted in Simone and, and is consistent with everything as you assume the legislature knew the law, number one. And you look, and look at the whole act in paramateria, which means you have to look at this act in conjunction with the Uniform Commercial Code, Judge, because if you don't, you will impliedly revoke a statute that you didn't intend to. And if you go to the Uniform Commercial Code, legislative intent is defined. If you go to 554.1103 and 554.1104, it will tell you that no other that there's a purpose to this act. It is a general self-contained act and no other statutes should be used to impliedly. And then when you go to the ex explanation by the legislature in the bill book that was attached to the bill as introduced, it said making them immune, that the purpose of it was making them immune from suit based upon strict liability and tort or breach of implied warranty. It didn't even limit it to merchantability based solely on an alleged defect in the original design or manufacture. I mean, that, that was the explanation they gave when they voted on it. And then there's a fiscal note even further back that talked about the effect of this uh, limiting those manufacturers. So, I, you know, if you're looking at legislative intent, don't we look at the legislative documents they use? Sure, sure. But how many remedies are there? There's one in tort and there's one in contract, and they're both the implied warranty of merchantability. If you look to a statute that's dealing with, first of all, you have to go through and, and very well understand the Uniform Commercial Code and its purpose. It's a self-contained integrated act that contains its own remedies and does not want other statutes and it specifically says that. And in this particular case, it was in the, in the, in the go ahead. In this particular case, the, the statute itself talks about alternately or in the disjunctive, and I'm almost afraid to say that word because I know what your interpretation and it's not artful and you can switch the disjunctive to the conjunctive, but in this case, you can at least look at this and say, these are equivalents. If your, your purpose here is to give interpretation and preserve the Uniform Commercial Code rather than destroy it and by implication in 613, a statute that's completely unrelated, which incidentally was additionally adopted as, as this court probably recalls, at least I do, at that, when I initially started practice in 73, I was so confounded because I'd come out of a, a pretty intense study of the Uniform Commercial Code and I couldn't understand why the, the implied warranty of merchantability was merchantability for contracts, which is a sale issue between a buyer and a merchant. But if you look at the language of the statute and read it in paramateria, it talks about designers, um, installers. This is the tort concept. It's that pretty simple because tort lawyers were using the implied, wor implied warranty of merchantability to get around statute limitations and other things to get personal injury damages. That's why they did it. I mean, we have a whole history of that. The problem is, you, we're, you, and that's what the, I think the appellate court got into, you're looking only at 613.18. You haven't looked at what the intention of the legislature and the purpose of the UCC, and, and let me just make it clear because here's what 1103 says, the, and Article 1 is the precursor you've got to read that is the introduction to how the Uniform Commercial Code, it, it describes, it tells you where you can waive the remedies, you start with Article 1, and here's what their intent was, because legislation and legislative intent is contained within the bill. It says, construction of this chapter uh, to promote its purpose and policies, applicable, uh, applicability of supplemental principles of law. This chapter must be liberally construed and applied to promote its underlying purpose and policy. Ask this question. If, if you're right, and let's assume you're right, 
and that the merchantability has nothing to do with 613, 18, if it's a contract case, when a lawyer uses it in a personal injury case, in the contract setting, not in the tort setting, then they should be able to sue everybody up and down the chain then because it wouldn't prevent them from doing it either. Judge, there's no such thing as a personal injury case in a contract. There's personal injury damages in a contract case. No, there is not. I mean, I don't mean to be disrespectful, but if the damage is to the product itself and does not go beyond that to the persons and property, by definition, it cannot be. All of your line of cases establish you're talking about the, the product liability section, section three, which specifically in its comment will tell you it's exempted out. Look at this entire line of cases that say you cannot file a tort claim for the damages to the product itself. Chief, could I ask one more question? Um, Mr. Walker, I, you attached to your further review application a page from S. Senate file 2265. Yes. And in the title of 61318, it says limitation on products liability of non-manufacturers. For clarification, is that, was that the title when the legislature voted on the provision? Yes, and actually you have a case where it even talks about that it's, it follows 402A and it discusses, it's the Bingham case that's cited and actually discusses the origin. Originally, Judge Wiggins, remember how we had to sue everyone in products liability all the way well, I know about this statute because I lobbied it, so well, you well, don't have to explain that to me. Well, all I'm saying is all of the, the cases that you have found will, will clearly <coughs> delineate and dis tell the lawyers who have filed them if this damage is limited to the failure of the product itself, and that doesn't mo mean consequential damages. It is in contract because it is putting the, someone back in the position they were before. These two theories grew up independently f because at common law, we had caveat emptor and there was no products liability. It was, f it was first established in 1916 with regard to food. And suddenly we started canning and we had to do something and that's the product liability history. At the same time, the tort, the contract theory of the same title was developed, resulted in the Uniform Sales Act, which was adopted by Iowa, which was the precursor to the Uniform Commercial Code. The next, the most important language, and I know I'm gonna get out of time here soon, but let me read you this, this paragraph. 554.1104, construction against implied repeal. That's the legislative intent and the statement in the first part of the Uniform Commercial Code that says, this chapter being a general act intended as a unified coverage of its subject matter, no part of it shall be deemed to be impliedly repealed by subsequent legislation if such construction can reasonably be avoided. Actually, Judge, that's very much consistent with the rule of construction that was already adopted in Iowa and you used in that Pella swimming pool case. But the, the legislature went this far to tell you this is a self-contained act. If you start having statutes that's, that take up little parts of it away, the interrelationship between all of the remedies and the purpose, which is to make an efficiency in interstate commerce between buyers and sellers, imagine the consequences if you don't have an implied warranty. Everybody with a mixer that's defective has to, sell a, has to sue a manufacturer. So let me ask you this, you're out of time, but um, you, you rely on the code editor um, a title that was used uh, to describe section 613.18. Only, only in part. I mean, if you okay. relied on that, you never get any further. But if you also, if you look back at uh, 554.23.14, uh, the implied warranty of merchantability section, at the end of that section, in 1987 and in every code since that time period, the code editor has identified um, a note at the end of that section and it says limitation and it refers you to section 6, uh, 13.18. So how, what, how are we to um, identify that action by the code editor in, in its, the code editor's conclusion that 554.23.13 
serves as a limitation to, or excuse me, other way around, this serves as a limitation. Okay. Remember the damage section that flows from the implied warranty merchantability includes consequential damages, and it also includes da any damages that were contemplated by the parties because of special use at the time uh, that the sale occurred. And then also there's a reference to personal injury. And if you have a personal, if you go to the damage section of the introduction in Article 1, they'll say there is no other remedies except those that are provided here. But there is a breach of the implied warranty of merchantability in a personal injury case, but that's under 613.18 and it's consistent. But I don't want you to think I'm just relying on this. I'm saying if you read the language, remember the UCC is only a sale between a buy remedy between a buyer and a merchant, not an, a designer, not the assembler, not all of the other people in the chain of title and potential liability on strict liability. And remember also those torts were always pled in strict liability, pro, um, implied warranty merchantability in tort and negligence. Well, but five uh, implied warranty merchantability has been a part of our law for a century or whatever. But in 1987, after section 613.18 immunity is enacted, and it's at that time, for the first time, the code editor then indicated that 554.23.14 is now limited by section 613.18. And I think to the extent that it refers to a personal injury, it is to be consistent with you. Because they still incorporate your laws to the extent that they are not inconsistent, don't repeal the UCC, but are supplementary, according to them. Also but, the, but the code editor doesn't read in the, the, the decades and generations of law that we're talking about here. The code editor looks at the relationship between one code section and another code section. All right. So what would be the motive for us to look at all of these acts and based upon the statement of the legislature at the UCC, why would we not read these and try to give meaning to 613.18 and UCC rather than gut the primary warranty that affects interstate and interstate commerce, especially when they tell us we don't want any of this implied revocation. Anything that's inconsistent is, can be supplementary but not inconsistent. But there is a reference that would tie you to 613.18 to, to the extent there was a breach of the implied warranty of merchantability that was re resulted in an injury. But that will go back to all of your cases and you'll see there is no, there are no, you will not permit any claim uh, based on tort unless the per there is a personal injury where the product defect itself causes that damage, not just the failure because the product doesn't live up to expectation. Thank you. Mr. Lawler. I'd like to disagree with uh, counsel on uh, his characterization of what constitutes a product liability claim uh, and the nature of uh, our principles of law, historical principles of law that can be used in a product's liability claim. A product's liability claim can be brought in tort and it can also be brought in contract. Uh, the breach of implied warranty, this court I think has over more recent years been clarifying and there was reference to the Barnhill case which was the uh, sanctions case has been clarifying that the breach of implied warranty of merchantability is a contract claim. It doesn't sound in tort in certain circumstances and sound in contract in others. It's a contract claim that is available uh, to a claimant in a personal injury case uh, at, in addition to the tort claims of strict liability and negligence and that's how it is I, and Mr. Lawyer, I don't necessarily disagree with you on that but Here's a concern I have with your interpretation. I go to Joe's Garden of Gears and I buy a used car from Joe, all right? And I pay the money, I drive it off the lot, the next day the engine falls out. What remedy do I have? Uh, 
I would, I would think, Your Honor, in that circumstance, the breach of implied warranty of merchantability may still be there. The question being is, is are we talking well, about a defect in the Why not? They didn't make the car. They, they didn't manufacture it. They didn't assemble it. They're just a dealer. The question is whether or not the allegation is, is that the cause of the failure of that engine in that vehicle is based solely upon its original design or manufacture. Because if you look at 613.18, the limitation uh, of when the claim for breach of implied warranty merchantability is not available yeah, says... But, but then look, okay, what look you at the second... Let me just follow up, Justice Wiggins, if you don't mind on that. Um, but go ahead and look at the, the follow-on sections. I agree, that section isn't involved here. I mean, here you're talking about uh, 1A, mm -hmm. but, but look at 2, or look at B, I mean, or, or look at 1B. Assuming that the, ma the manufacturer, you know, let's say it's GM, they're subject to jurisdiction in this state. But they say, you know, we made that car long ago. Statute of repose is uh, gone, is expired, and there wasn't any defect when we sold it, you know, years ago. Uh, I, I'm, I have no remedy, right? Well, I, I think, first of all, with a used car, it's probably an as-is sale, Your Honor, in the, in the first place. There's probably not, there may not be an implied warranty of merchantability on that, depending on the nature of that sale. Any warranty there is probably spelled out in connection with the purchase yeah, Let agreement. me add to the facts of that case, because the legislature made a tough choice here. What happens if the motor falls out, as Justice Mansfield says, but it falls out on a train track and a train comes by and kills you? Well, I mean, what, what right do you have? So if you differentiate this thing, you can, sue the, you can sue the car dealer because the motor fell out and there was only property damage, but you can't sue the car dealer because the motor fell out because there's personal injury damage. I mean, if you're going to apply the statute that way, I mean, the legislature makes these tough choices. Why, why do you think the legislature made, made that choice to cut everybody off at that? I, I think, Your Honor, it's because the, it, this, our case is a, maybe a prime example of why the legislature would make the choice that it did. In this circumstance, we have a windshield that was, uh, the part cost $19,300 some dollars, $6,300 to put it in. It's undisputed that the defect was an original manufacturing defect concealed under the edge seal of the windshield that its edge seal is not removed, not tampered with. There's no possible way that that defect could be identified by the ultimate seller. And yet what is, and it's in the record in this case, the counterclaim that will go back to the district court if the court reverses the court district court is for $103,000 of loss of use on a $19,000 windshield with a completely innocent seller. The seller, in this case, had no possible way, did not contribute to the problem, had no possible way to know about it. It was from the original Don't we have, in contract cases, innocent sellers all the time? I mean, you, you, you contract to deliver a good uh, that has certain characteristics and it doesn't. Um, I mean, we, you know, fault concepts don't come into contract law as a general matter. That's, that's absolutely true, Justice uh, Apple. But the, 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 the point is, is to answer the question of why the legislature would do what it did here. I think it was trying to, to identify the circumstance, the one circumstance where there seems to be a potential complete level of innocence on behalf of the seller for something that the manufacturer did. And that's where the seller did not assemble, design, or manufacture. All they're doing is selling it, and the claim is solely, and the word solely appears in A, is alleging a defect in the original design or manufacturer. If you look in B, uh, 613.1B, and on down to 2 and 3, you'll see then they're doing a balancing act where they're saying, okay, if you, if you have a little more involvement seller than that, where maybe you assembled the product, or maybe the claim isn't based upon just solely upon the original design, now you're only safe from this suit if uh, the manufacturer is amenable to suit. Didn't, didn't they have a claim against the manufacturer? They did. And why, why didn't they pursue that? I mean, that the whole, I think the whole purpose of the legislature was get the person who did the defect rather than someone in the chain, whether it be for personal injury or property damage. So why, 
Why is there any evidence in the record of why they didn't go after the manufacturer? I have no idea why they didn't because the, the, the manufacturer was summary judgment out on the economic loss doctrine and I think there was an appealable issue on that because the way the court more recently has addressed the economic loss doctrine, uh, if you look at the Tomka case and at the American Fire case which is cited uh, by opposing counsel in his uh, reply brief, the court has, has trended to what is considered the intermediate rule on the economic loss doctrine, which is it's not just a question of whether or not it's only economic loss. The question is, is whether or not uh, the product was dangerous to the user. Uh, are there defects, uh, in other words, uh, and the court in Tomka citing the Wisconsin Supreme Court says, as the Wisconsin Supreme Court summarized, defects of suitability and quality are redressed through contract actions and safety hazards through tort actions try to bring a, a contract claim or a breach of warranty claim against the manufacturer? They, they included a breach, I think they included a breach of the implied warranty emergency and, and claim is in the there as well. factual statement of Mr. Walker accurate that basically they, they, I assume they probably would have been out of luck on a claim under uh, contract UCC against the manufacturer because the manufacturer had a, a warranty that was limited to six months which had run out, right? Well, I, the, 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 the warranty issue, Your Honor, is an interesting one because we're operating here as, uh, uh, for the purpose of the trial court and on appeal as if there were no limitations of warranty, which is broader than if there was a limitation of warranty. Because he's correct. My client failed to get uh, the limitation of the implied warranties to him. So we're operating as, on the assumption that absent this immunity or some other reason, the implied warranty of merchantability would be in place. The express warranty, you only have an express warranty if you have it. But if I'm the manufacturer, I'm going to say it's not my fault that your client didn't communicate the warranty to the ultimate buyer. I'm Absolutely. I'm going to say I, I get the benefit of my limitation, my exclusion of the implied warranty and my six-month limitation, right? Well, I, 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 that's an interesting argument because arguably we're, we're the agent or representative of the manufacturer, and so therefore through agency principles that, that failure to communicate is a failure by the manufacturer to communicate uh, the, the uh, limitation on the um, implied warranty. But okay. there, there, was, there were claims brought in on a products liability type theories, and I think there was also breach of implied warranty against Piper. They got partially summary judgment out. Obviously, when the notice of appeal was filed, it, sh it could have been, and if I were Mr. Walker, I would have served it on Piper, because I think with what the court has said, particularly American Fire, uh, we said tort theory is generally available when the harm results from a sudden or dangerous occurrence, the common thread running through our cases, rejecting recovery under an implied warranty of merchantability, rejecting recovery, is the lack of danger created by the defective product. And here we had a windshield at 24,000 feet that shatters. Now, it fortunately didn't blow in and the and pressurization of the aircraft wasn't lost. But if there's ever a failure of a product where there is only economic loss, but it could have been, certainly could have created a very dangerous situation, it's the Payne-Stewart situation where you know, the aircraft depressurized and everybody passes out, this is it. And so I think that it's not that there's no remedy available. I think the, the wrong parties are standing here before you now. There was probably an appealable issue on the district courts allowing Piper out of this case. Well, let, let, let me ask you this. Um, this case is, is um, similar to the first one argued this afternoon as it comes down to a statutory interpretation. And 613.18 um, provides the, the legislature, we all agree, has provided uh, immunity. And it, the question is, to what extent does that immunity, how broad is the immunity? And so we look at the language used by the legislature, and it says that the immunity is from any suit based upon strict liability in tort. Why is it that the, in, in that part of the sentence, why is it that the legislature would have used the word in tort in describing strict liability? Well, I, I, because I, uh, I believe, I don't believe there is strict liability in contract. I mean, I think strict liability in tort is the... Is so the why would they have used the in tort? Why wouldn't they have just said strict liability? Isn't that what 402A called it? Strict liability I think, in tort? I, I think that, was that is title. correct. I, th I, think, I think that's correct. I think that's going to the original uh, uh, restatement type of language. But you'll, you'll notice, Your Honor, as it was pointed out by, uh, or in, did, in does that indicate that the legislature had torts in mind when they were um, talking about immunity? 
with regard to strict liability, but then they reference or breach of implied warranty of merchantability. And this, it, we must be mindful that 613.18 was passed well after the uniform, as the Court of Appeals pointed out, well after the uh, Uniform Commercial Code, which gave and spelled out uh, the, uh, the breach of implied warranty of merchantability. And the language in 613.18 is, uh, is uh, not qualified or limited down to personal injury. I think that if you look at the pronouncement, The counsel, this, that's also true with the Comparative Fault Act. It defines fault to include negligence, strict liability, et cetera, et cetera, and breach of warranty. But in the Flom v. Staley case, we interpreted it where there was a, a warranty claim made. We said that doesn't apply without a personal injury or damage to property other than the contract. Why wouldn't we reach the same result here and say 613.18 is limited to uh, personal injury or cases, not contract cases. Well, Your Honor, I think that if the, the problem is what we do not want to do is confuse the type of damages that have occurred, personal injury, with tort. Those are not synonymous. And, and so if you look into the Uniform Commercial Code, the Uniform Commercial Code includes in the list of damages available there, recoverable there, injury to the person for a breach of implied warranty. That's consistent with this court more recently having interpreted uh, or having pronounced that there is no breach of implied warranty of merchantability in tort. Breach of implied warranty of merchantability is a contract claim. It can include as an element of damages, personal injury type damages. But if the legislature wanted to say that, there's, that this immunity here, nowhere in 613.18 is there a reference to personal injury. It's the liability the, of the seller. The title I mean, we can argue about it, the title, but am I correct that when the legislature passed the legislation, it had the title in it that it has now? It wasn't just added by the code editor. It had the title, Limitation on Products Liability of Non-Manufacturers. Am I right about that? Yes, but, but products liability doesn't mean tort. Products liability means what it says, liability based upon a product. Now, but it, boy, but it's, not, it's never been, in, I mean, that means product liability for what? For damage to something other than the product, right? Well, uh, but. I mean, under your interpretation, if I go to uh, Walmart and buy a toaster and I get home and it doesn't work, I can't sue Walmart for a breach of implied warranty. I have to go to the toaster manufacturer. I mean, it seems like you're in, your interpretation is very anti-consumer. But, but that's where the warranty, in fact, comes from. The warranty does come from the manufacturer, the warranty that's in the box with it and whatever limitations are on that warranty. And I think in practice what we're seeing is, is that you do go to the manufacturer for, for that warranty repair. You, know, you could take it back to Walmart and they'll exchange it for you. The, we still have sellers in Iowa that are the, themselves the maker of the products. We need to be mindful that not all products are coming down through a distribution chain from some original manufacturer through to some seller. What our legislature was seeking to do here was to protect the seller in, the, in those narrow circumstances where the seller had no possible role, hand, or finger in causing the failure and is potentially subject to huge liability. I can go out and buy at the local hardware store a, a light switch that costs less than a dollar and somebody could install it and have a, a, a million dollar loss on a building because of a short circuit in that light switch that was manufactured by some other manufacturer. Do we really want, does our legislature want the seller who got one dollar for the light switch to owe a million dollars for those damages? I see my time is up. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lawyer. Mr. Walker, rebuttal. I can st stand any more of this debate. Um, well, let me just start by. Mr. Walker, I have some questions then. The, the first question I have, you include in your application for further review the title of the section of the bill. But the Constitution, Article 3, Section 29, deals with the title of a bill itself, which is much broader than that title of what it's supposed to do. Is there any reason why you didn't include the title of the, the, title of the bill? which is the one that governs um, Article 3, Section 29 of the Constitution? Well, the approach that I took was the one, th is the basic rule of construction that you look at everything in paramateria. You look at both, you have to look at both statutes. Just, and so far, nobody's done anything except looked at one. But in, in opinions, when you do construction, if, it, if it's two opposing statutes, 
you look at both of them. The different, but, but isn't the, the title to the bill a lot broader and the explanation a lot broader than just picking out that then, one sentence? Then look at that as well. Look at that, but look at the Uniform Commercial Code. Look at what their request is from you as to what's going to happen if there's another statute that might undermine this UCC. One other question. What happens if the window blew out and the pilot was killed? Would the pilot have a cause of action against the um, uh, course. The blind flying, or would it be precluded because of this section? Remember, the remedy under Iowa law for, is determined by the relief that's at. If, if, you, if I have an assault oh, So somebody can, now can have a personal injury case against the, if it was personal injury damages, they can also collect those personal injury damages under the warrant and merchant bill, because we allow personal injury damages under it. You can go back to Hawkeye Security versus Ford in 19... Exactly. 1970, we said you can do that. Exactly. And the difference is, if you have, it's very simple. The remedy for the implied warranty of merchantability, like every other remedy, depends on the relief you're asking. If I say assault and battery, you're going to wonder, are you filing a criminal case to punish me or a civil case because of my injury? If you're looking at the implied warranty of merchantability, are you dealing with a contract under the uniform commercial? Light code? switch case that uh, Mr. Lawyer talked about, the seller of that dollar switch could be liable if there was personal injury for the death of the person who, if, if they died in that fire. Not if it was, no, because the, the statute 613.18 says that if it's strict liability or applied warranty of merchantability, or if there's damage to the person, the person or property of the other, it's only in tort. We're talking about a case here that is limited only to the product itself and therefore is only under contract under, let me just read one line of, Here's a rose of boom, and this is every case that you have. The line to be drawn, um, plaintiff cannot maintain a claim for purely economic damages arising out of negligence. The, de the Detterman case says, the line to be drawn is one between tort and contract than, rather than between physical harm and economic loss. When the loss relates to a consumer or user's disappointed expectations due to deterioration, internal breakdown, or non-accidental causes, the remedy lies in contract. In drawing the line between contract and tort, we have consistently allowed recovery in tort where the product was dangerous to the user and caused injuries extending to property other than the product itself. So a tort remedy is to reimburse you for damage and loss where a contract... The statute doesn't say a product other than itself. That's where I'm getting... I can't read the statute that way. It says an alleged defect in the original designer manufacturer of the product. And if there's a, a defect in the designer manufacturer of the product, it doesn't limit who the injury is to and what the injury is caused by, and what type of damages there are. So what, you're, what you have to do to reach that decision is you have to make the assumption that the statute which deals with designers, assemblers, manufacturers, and sellers, in this case, overrules a uniform commercial code that deals with contracts, and that strict liability is in the same sentence, which is a personal injury claim with the claim implied warranty under contract, which doesn't permit Or you could assume damage. the legislature wanted to protect sellers who don't do anything to a product. It's strictly a manufacturer's defect that you have to look to the manufacturer first, and if they're amenable to suit, either by jurisdiction or by lack of bankruptcy, you can't go after the Iowa seller. That's you, can look at it, you can look at it that way, too, what the legislature did. As long as you're willing to nullify the entire purpose of the Uniform Commercial Code, which is to give a remedy between the buyer and seller for a product that's defective. I don't think that defective. gets in the way of the legislature what they do over there. Well, don't we have a duty to try to harmonize the Uniform Commercial Code warranty provision and this? And isn't the easy way to harmonize it, as you say, the, the tort statute, which has product liability in its caption, is limited to personal injury and, and tort theories? Absolutely, and that's your rule of construction. You do, the, this court abhors impliedly repealing statutes when there's any chance that you can read it. And since we have a clear understanding that you could have a contract and a tort, you never have to reach that decision. And you don't have to violate the intentions of the UCC and the legislature, which says if there's something inconsistent, it's supplementary. We don't want you to do anything. The modifications of the UCC happen within the act. It's self-contained. It has its own remedies. Are you sick of this issue? Thank you, counsel. Thank you. The uh, case then is submitted, and I'll ask the bailiff to adjourn court. Hear ye, hear ye. 
The Honorable Supreme Court of the State of Iowa is now adjourned.